as you can see, um, my, my talk will be about uncertainty quantification of quantum chemical methods. So I thought that this fits uh, the general topic quite well. Um, and you will see it will also address uh, how to address large problems. And large problems basically means either large molecules or very many calculations on small problems. Um, give you a brief outline of what I intend to, to discuss with you. Uh, and I grouped this into three categories. Uh, one is, the first is introducing the context, and that will be mostly uh, in high throughput calculations, um, because there the problem is most evident uh, as you generate huge amounts of data and you need to know how good the data is. Of course, if you do calculations manually, uh, you, you face the same problems. Um, then I'd like to discuss some general statements, um, general considerations. Um, that go back to this paper that you can see here that was re recently published in the Israel Journal of Chemistry. And um, that is a paper um, where I try to, to elaborate on how, in principle, uncertainty quantification can be done for um, uh, quantum chemical problems. And uh, once we have discussed that, I will switch to a spe few specific examples so that you can see what can be done and, and um, what can be accomplished with this. So let's first uh, switch to context. Um, they think about um, the, the calculation of an enormous amount of, of, of data. So in high throughput virtual screening, for instance, but of course you, you also have that in molecular dynamic simulations. And my focus here is because that is my, my specific expertise and uh, interest is on reaction networks. And so the way we look at reaction mechanisms is that uh, we try to automatically map out reaction networks. And you will see a couple of examples, but uh, here a lot of data is generated and uh, for various reasons that we will discuss uh, on the next slides, you basically need to know how good the data is because otherwise you can't draw any reliable conclusion. Um, the way we do these, uh, explorations that is in a fully automated manner and we have automated algorithms basically for everything which allows us to have an autonomous kind of robot to do the explorations and from time to time you can check uh, what has been found and uh, that is shown by the machinery to you um, but for these autonomous explorations we need automated um, algorithms um, since we are going to, to do very many calculations on comparatively uh, um, moderately sized molecules, but like I said, you can do fewer calculations on larger systems, will be the same problem. Uh, we need to go for um, fast methods, right? Because otherwise we can't look at uh, the, the um, molecular structure space or the chemical space in sufficient depths. And of course, with uh, fast methods uh, comes the compromise on accuracy. And uh, we will talk about that uh, later on. Uh, we have, in order to accomplish this, we had to do a couple of new developments to make things uh, fast and stable because there will be no human being to interfere. That, that is not possible. Uh, but that is no, now all in, in place and uh, we face a big data problem. So we can do explorations of, of chemical uh, mechanisms and we create a huge amount of quantum chemistry data there's no way that you can look at it manually and we need to know how good the data is let me show you an old example this is uh, from a 2017 paper um, this tool that we have developed is called chemoton it's now being released in in as a, a chemoton 2.0 version uh, this is the old version where you see the graphical user interface. Basically, what you see is, is, a, is a network that doesn't talk to you. But uh, each of these uh, circles represents a molecular structure. You can look at the structures. And the structures are connected through elementary reaction steps. Uh, let me give you an example. So uh, we applied this in 2017 to what is called in chemistry the Formos reaction. That is a condensation reaction. As you can see um, from simple molecules, you create uh, more complex molecules that is thought to be of prebiotic uh, relevance. And um, for this reaction, a couple of um, studies were already in the literature, um, for instance, by the Asporoguzi group, and we thought that this is a proper uh, 
example to test our algorithms. So what we did is we cal performed DFT calculations with a reasonable functional, PBE functional, pure functional, and a double zeta basis. Uh, just to give you an idea at the time of the uh, dimension of calculations that we carried out, 150,000 calculations, we found 1,000 unique molecular configurations, 10,000 transition states. And this is the condensation reaction at some point of a certain molecular weight, we simply stop. It would go on, but we stop. Uh, what we obtained is still the largest network obtained so far for, for the reaction, but it is still very small, if not tiny, compared to what uh, is really important in this context, because uh, we neglected solvation, we neglected uh, catalysis, and all these compounds need to be taken into account, and uh, you would see a combinatorial explosion. Uh, this is a small section of the network. It already looks very complicated. Again, all the circles represent structures. Uh, the structures are color coded so you, that you can have a rough idea of uh, what is going on. So in blue, you see the starting molecules from aldehyde and, and glycol aldehyde, and, and you see that uh, there are carbon species, uh, organic molecules formed with, with up to four carbon atoms. So that is encoded in this green color. And we go up to uh, sugar molecules like petros and, and triosis. So um, this is the data. Now, what you see here is basically the data that was generated. And of course, you, you can analyze the data automatically with algorithms so, and ask questions. And, and so the algorithm pulls out information for you. So for instance, you, you ask for all the paths that connect the starting material with the sugar molecule, because these are ways to generate sugar molecules. And, and, and these paths you see here. So the information is there. You can interpret that and and do chemistry with this. And of course, this is a simple example. You, it, it is um, as, um, an idea, of course, conceptually, that is the very basis of all chemistry, right? Uh, here's another example where we uh, studied this uh, from the perspective of catalysis, homogeneous and heterogeneous catalysis. Um, the data here, again, just to give you an idea of, of how much uh, data is actually generated, um, is for the reaction of propylene and oxygen. And in this paper that was published this year in topics of in catalysis, we analyzed um, the computational effort to really figure out what's going on um, reaction-wise with these molecules and also if you connect to some catalytic system. <coughs> I'm sorry. The settings um, have some limitations and just because of the uh, combinatorial explosion of options. So uh, if we found activation barriers for reaction steps that were bigger than 200 kilojoules per mole, then we neglected them. And we also introduced uh, a size limit of the molecules that were generated. The resulting network, again, 4,200 compounds connected by 6,300 reactions. In total, we had to carry out a billion energy calculations. And in order to do that in a reasonable time, um, DFT is no longer possible. And we had to go for approximate DFT. So that is DFT tight binding. And in fact, we used uh, Stefan Grimm's type of tight binding, but any other would do, of course, provided that the parameters are there. Um, so this is approximate DFT. And it's getting even more um, severe to understand whether the energies are reliable. And frankly, they are mostly not. Uh, but uh, even worse, also, of course, you see that structure prediction is no longer valid, whereas, whereas that works well with standard DFT, with approximate DFT, it's a different story. And you carry out these billion calculations, you need 5,000 days on, of CBU time. And um, in order to get a graphical representation of what's actually going on, which is color-coded according to um, the order of discovery, um, we created this, uh, this figure here. Yeah, where each endpoint refers to a structure. So it's, it's a huge amount of data. The data is necessary because it fully describes the chemistry, yet you don't know how good the data is. So it will be very hard to extract um, reliable conclusions based on the, on the data. And uh, um, that should be obvious, of course, but if you even consider kinetic modeling, where you try to get rates which depend uh, through an exponential expression on energy differences, you understand that small, tiny changes in the energy will have huge effects on rates, right? And so to figure out what the accuracy is, is, is key. Um, which brings me to a brief overview of how that is done. Uncertainty quantification or error 
uh, estimation or error assessment, uh, however you like to call that. So we face a problem that our methods, um, they include approximations of various kinds, and those approximations compromise accuracy, right? Um, problem is that the effect of the approximations we typically don't assess because that's really hard to assess. Um, but as a consequence, we don't know uh, how certain or uncertain the, the chemical conclusions are. And so actually we need to come up with a way to assess this uncertainty. The way it's done usually is you compare to accurate reference calculations, but that you can be done only for a limited number of systems and typically these systems are small. And you rely on benchmark studies, but then you will face a problem that you don't know anything about transferability. Right? Typically, um, and I think this is not a good, good um, attitude in the community, but it is uh, born out of necessity. Um, you have to, um, you study a benchmark and, and, and then you convince yourself that it is somehow transferable, although you have no evidence whatsoever whether it's really transferable to the system you're looking at, right? And in fact, if you do a lot of computational chemistry, um, uh, you will face uh, situations where things go well and you understand because you have some experimental data to compare with, and suddenly the same method for a very similar problem um, fails, and you see huge discrepancies, and those are hard to, to explain because uh, the way we set up our, our approximations are, of course, uh, very involved and not easy to disentangle. Uh, so that's not a good situation. And now I, I start with these general remarks on, on quantum chemical methods, which I elaborated on in this, uh, in this paper that you can see up there. And so I try to um, justify why, in fact, I believe that um, we need a Bayesian way of looking at things in order to figure out uh, how accurate data is. Um, so, but let me walk you through, through the um, individual ideas. So first of all, you can see that's the first statement, which says that uh, the theoretical foundations of electronic structure theory, which is the basis of these quantum chemical methods, um, are well established and understood. And what do I, do I mean by that? Because you could, you, you could argue that uh, what we are doing is a model anyways. And um, so maybe one needs to worry about the physical foundations. And the nice thing for computational chemistry is that we very well know the underlying physical theory. And in fact, of all quantum field theories, we have to deal with a theory that is best developed, right? And that is quantum electrodynamics. And we have this theory in our hands since 1948. Um, what is good for us is that all other forces are either short ranged or very weak, so we can ignore them. And, and so the only um, fundamental interaction that we need to deal with is um, electromagnetism. Now, in fact, what, what uh, has been established in relativistic quantum chemistry over decades is what is called in chemistry a first quantized theory and in physics uh, a semi classical theory, which is uh, a theory where the matter field is quantized, which is what we usually do, and the radiation field is, is considered as a classical field. So the radiation field is not quantized. So we don't have a second quantization typically of the radiation field. Um, in this framework, it can be very well um, disentangled. Um, how to approximate um, or how to find um, many particle Hamiltonians that approximate the, the physical system very well. So we have approximations already here at a very fundamental level, but that is very well understood, often atomically conserved. It can be systematically improved if necessary, but that does not create the, the most fundamental problem that we have in chemistry. The most fundamental problem that we have no surprise is actually the two particle Coulomb interaction. And even in the, in the relativistic regime, the uh, leading term of the electron electron interaction is the non relativistic uh, instantaneous Coulomb interaction. And so the Coulomb interaction creates um, basically all of the problems that we have. Right? Now, um, we introduce a couple of methods to work with approximate many electron or many particle Hamiltonians. And um, these methods make approximations in terms of the answers for the wave function 
for equally well for potentials if you think about density functional theory. Uh, but still there is a, then again a technical step which introduces more approximations like a discretization error on a numerical grid or if you introduce a, a, a basis function uh, such as, as an orbital or geminal basis set. But these discretization errors, in principle, they, they are well controllable. In practice, they are often not. Um, you can try to extrapolate to the basis at limit. That means uh, is that the point for it's, it's well controllable, but of course it's expensive. And so often this is not that. Um, so the key issue here is that if you take everything together, the discretization error, the methodological error, you will have an individual absolute error for a specific system, which will depend, let me say, on the external potential, right? I mean, the representation of your atomic system will be governed by the external potential. You can think about the homberg cohn theorem, for instance. And um, for different um, external potentials, you will see different errors. And uh, a priori, you typically don't know what the error is. And, and that, is, that is the key issue. So in order to cope with this, I already said that, that often you rely on your intuition or your experience. You refer some, to some benchmark data set. You have some uh, knowledge about your system and so on, right? And there are, of course, error compensation processes in, um, in operation. But the point is that for a specific system out of a class of similar systems, you don't know what the error is. And any approximation can actually uh, create a large unexpected error. And that is a true problem for um, truly predictive approaches. So we have a good, very good understanding of, of the underlying theory, in fact, uh, but we don't know how to deal with the error. You can think about, and of course, um, people also in the audience are working on figuring out how the error could be assessed analytically, right? But this is, it's a super difficult task. You could think about um, having a complement to the variational principle, where uh, in addition to um, the low lower bound, you will have an upper bound. And so you can kind of bracket the result. But um, for practical application, that's probably very hard to, to, to use routinely. And also, you never know whether the, the bracket that you can estimate is small enough to have a reliable error estimate. Um, and then there's this issue that for, for benchmark results, um, transferability is not at all guaranteed. Um, indications for this are often obtained for the training data set itself. When you look at um, mean measures for the, for the accuracy of the data on the training data set that you achieve compared to largest absolute deviations and so on, which give you a hint of what the accuracy is but within the training data set, but of course you know nothing about how, how these things perform if you leave the training data set. So this is the reason why I think that Bayesian uncertainty quantification is the way to go. And that um, uh, requires of continuous benchmarking. I mean, if, if you can't rely on, the, the, to me of the, the, the um, um, way I understand what's going on is that, that uh, people hope that with increasing size of benchmark sets, um, you cover a significant all, all parts of chemical space that are relevant. And I think this is, um, this is kind of a romantic belief um, that probably does not hold true. And if that is true, we need continuous benchmarking. So you go for a specific system uh, and that requires you to do some benchmark calculation for that specific system. Within that system, you still don't know whether it's the, the data that you, for which you have the, the reference data is transferable to, to a similar structure. So you need to create a mechanism which is objective in a sense, so it does not relate to my gut feeling, uh, whether this um, transferability is, is, is uh, somehow guaranteed by some measure. Right? And so that requires rolling benchmarking because you need to be able um, to get benchmark data on demand. And if you uh, think about these, these computational campaigns, like in high throughput virtual screening, of course, uh, you need to be able to get the data um, automatically. There's no way around this. And of course, as a human being, you don't want to waste your time with this. And you just want to have the data and, and know how good the data is. Um, and so say, if you can do that, and we'll talk about how that could be done, then, um, you still face a problem that you need to transfer the knowledge, right? 
And here you can take confidence intervals, for instance, from machine learning models. Um, you can basically take any machine mo learning model. Uh, we will look into Gaussian process regression later on, but that is just an example. And, of, and, and then there's, of course, one catch, and that is uh, you need some measure that tells you how similar things are in, in configuration space, how similar two molecules are. And, and of course, the reliability will crucially depend on, on, on such a measure. I will come back to this uh, later on. OK. So um, this is a side remark. If that is, would be possible. So to have kind of knowledge-based error estimation in a way that rigorously transfers the knowledge to neighboring structures, um, then, of course, you could even uh, alleviate a problem that uh, is the vast amount of acronyms or methods that have been developed. I mean, when you look into the literature, every approximation comes with its, with, with its own capital letter abbreviation, right? And there are already so many that I think there is not a single expert who can explain any of these, right? Of course, you can always explain a fraction, but if it's your, not your specific discipline, uh, it will be a problem. It will be also difficult to assess what that means accuracy-wise. And if you consider um, the field in the long run, where do we stand in 20, 30 years? If, if this process goes on, we will have more and more acronyms. And how do we cope with the situation? Here, if we have a way to, to pick a model and assess the error and go with this error and maybe use the error to improve on the model, we might have a way to, to get rid of some of the acronyms and simplify computational chemistry. Um, because the key point here is, that's the next conclusion, any model that is um, fast is typically not accurate because you need to compromise on accuracy if you go uh, for speed, um, the, if you solve the Schrödinger equation uh, in the very fundamental way, as I described uh, earlier, uh, of, your, of course, you can approach any accuracy. But if you want to do this routinely for large systems or for many, for many small systems, you need to compromise and um, the accuracy uh, will, be, will always be an issue. Um, so then if you do what I described, you basically end up working on system-focused models that can be set up in, in various ways. For instance, like you have a general, generalist um, model, which works more or less well for all the species. Uh, then you have a scheme that tells you how well it actually works for your species, uh, which brings you to a specific improvement of your species. Right? And you can, gener you can generalize system-focused models. And as long as you know how good the system-focused model actually is, that should be no problem. Um, I mean, it's semi-empirical in a sense, of course, uh, and it breaks these first principles nature of uh, most of the methods in quantum chemistry, but it will be fast and you have a rigorous error estimate. Uh, if you want to go for that, you need autonomous procedures because there's no way that you can do this manually. So let's look into examples. I picked two. Um, one, of course, relates to my, my, uh, my um, starting example, which is reaction network exploration. And I'd like to discuss with you how that can be done in an error-controlled way, so that you see species, new molecular structures, and that you have an idea of how accurate your data actually is. And then I will, will go to a specific model, which is semi-classical dispersion interactions. That's a way to um, assess weak interactions through a force field a type of um, model, which has become very popular in the field um, because DFT lacks these dispersion interactions and that semi-classical correction, um, which was uh, developed um, in, in recent years, mostly in Stefan Grimme's group, um, are very efficient and very accurate. But the problem is if your system grows and you have all sorts of error compensation or, or failure of error compensation, in the end, you don't know, but you need to know how good the model is. So individually, the corrections are small, but you are, since you're creating so many of them, it can accumulate. Okay. Uh, in both cases, we will work with Gaussian processes. You can pick another um, inter-extrapolation model. You can also work with, with uh, neural networks. We work with Gaussian processes, uh, where we have two input inputs, i and j, which are compared. And this yields uh, a covariance function in a way 
uh, that training allows us to construct the model in a in a rolling fashion. So we optimize the hyperparameter. <coughs> oh, so I'm sorry. The hyperparameters sigma and L, and uh, from the uh, Gaussian process regression, we we get a um, confidence interval and of course that gets the more narrow the more data we have so in red you see uh the actually the truth that we want is just a model of course um for illustration purposes that we want to approximate then we have the data in 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 white you see as that the uh confidence interval here is sketched in blue and uh you have huge uncertainty where you where you lack the data and uh the here on the x axis this um Parameter tells you in the end uh, if you pass into this region to the right hand side uh, whether or not or at what point you will need more reference data in in order to uh, increase the reliability of your results. So let's do that for the reaction network exploration. So we obtain our observable of interest. That's typically our energy in this case from the statistical model from the Gaussian process, and we get an error estimate. And that's very that's a key point from the statistical model. Now, if this error estimate that we see is above a, a given threshold, and you can can choose this very conservatively, um, you create reference data, and the, the new reference data is then uh, added to the to the to the training set, and you retrain the model. So that looks a bit like this. You see a couple of reference points here as black cop. Um, uh, crosses uh, and you see that in between um, the interpolation gives you different um, um, uh, confidence intervals and where you hit, like the data the variance will be large right the variance is will be constructed from the similarity measure I will talk about the similarity measure in a second and uh, if you enter this space here uh, you need to create more data so um, we need the similarity measure to to be able to compare molecules in chemical space for this purpose. And uh, we used in this study the smooth overlap, overlap of atomic potentials, in short, SOAP, that was developed by Gabor Chani and uh, co workers. We could have used also the Coulomb matrix from the studies that we have conducted. Um, our impression is that the SOAP works, works really reliable in this case. And uh, that tells us this SOAP kernel tells us uh, about the molecular similarity. Right. And on the left-hand side, you see a sketch for this. And actually, these are molecules that are from a standard database, uh, which we use to construct and kind of an artificial reaction network. Uh, you see exploration progress, again, colored in uh, from um, violet to, to yellow. And wherever, so, so this is a tree where uh, we uh, see with all the circles, some of them are hard to identify, uh, where we see all the individual structures that were visited. And for the red dots, these are species for which the Gaussian process determined that it's necessary to have a reference calculation. And uh, we did this with a uh, couple cluster calculations. And uh, the rest of the data was generated with fast DFD calculations. And of course, you can do that with anything, right? You can also use type binding DFD and then compare to reference calculations. You can consider DFT as a reference, and then you can have another layer where you compare the couple cluster. But if you are now an expert in quantum chemistry, you may think, okay, but wait, a uh, couple cluster is only well defined if it's all single reference, so kind of closed shell, uh, no nasty electronic structure, and for the general case, it might collapse, and you wouldn't know. That's true. So you need a scheme which is multi-configurational, and that's an issue because it's an unsolved problem in chemistry, because uh, we have no multi-configurational scheme available in chemistry that is as accurate as um, the typical couple cluster singles, doubles, perturbatively treated triples model, right? But that's a different story. Uh, we are accurate, but not as accurate, I would say. The key issue is a different one, because if you go multi-configurational, you suddenly need to pick your active space of orbitals, which are relevant, and um, because uh, these models are always uh, layered schemes where you construct a wave function in an active orbital space. And selecting the orbitals is an art by itself. And of course, if this is true, then it would break all automatism and the whole idea uh, um, uh, goes to dust, right? Uh, because it would mean that it can, cannot be done. 
But in fact, it can be made black box, and we have shown that this is possible. We have done that with uh, DMRG, so the data density matrix renormalization group, which is kind of uh, exact diagonalization approach in an active orbital space. Uh, it delivers um, results that are CASA-CF type results for those in the audience who, who know what I'm talking about, but it relies on a different scheme, right? And the scheme is uh, the wave function is represented at matrix, as matrix product states. You can see here on the left-hand side, the typical CI representation where you expand uh, your many particle wave function in terms of uh, many particle basis states, these occupation number vector sigma with a coefficient in front of it. Now here, the key is that this coefficient is decomposed. There's a tensor decomposition. This is a tensor train format. It's called in physics matrix product state. And uh, we can optimize uh, the coefficients in these matrices. Uh, there's another representation for, for any uh, many particle operator, and that's an accordingly called matrix product operator format. And we have a computer program that can work with this. Uh, so we have a, a computer program that can work with this and solves the fact that traditional approaches cannot really tackle large orbital spaces, but we still have not found a way to choose the orbitals. And this we do by entanglement measures. So traditionally, people uh, would have a gut feeling to know what kind or would, would have a trial and error procedure to figure out what, uh, what, what orbitals need to be picked. And then there are some recipes that, that rest on, on natural occupation numbers, for instance. Um, but the discrimination between different values for um, um, electronically complicated systems with dense states is really tricky. So we found that it's much better to use entanglement measures. And this is um, our measures taken from quantum information theory, where we have eigenvalues of um, one orbital and two orbital reduced density matrices. Uh, these are given here as omegas, and they enter a Shannon or von Neumann type um, information theory expression, which allows us to compute an entropy. Right? And this entropy actually measures um, entanglement, orbital entanglement. So we are talking about the single particle states here. And uh, orbital entanglement, as you can in see in this example, is actually a measure for, for correlation and tells you uh, what kind of orbitals need to be explicitly treated in the wave function construction in the active space. Uh, the example here is dioxygen, uh, because this is an example that is typically well known in chemistry. Um, this is a molecular orbital diagram. Uh, if, you, if you know this, you will recognize this if, if you don't ignore. Um, where uh, there are two determinants. This is one determinant, and that is another determinant of equal weight, uh, which makes the multi-configurational nature of this problem. Uh, there's these pi star orbitals, six and seven, which are in this state, either doubly occupied here, or the other one, the degenerate orbital is doubly occupied. And you see from the single orbital entropy that these have the largest value of the single orbital entropy. In these entanglement diagrams, uh, the numerical value is of no importance, but because as you can see right away that these are the critical orbits, they need to go into the active space. Uh, there are more orbitals that are also strongly correlated, and then there are others which are. And um, the connecting lines, this is mutual information, that is uh, an information theoretic measure that is extracted for a pair of orbitals uh, from the two orbital entropy, as uh, shown here in these equations. Um, in our studies, we found that the single orbital entropy is sufficient. So we have a selection algorithm based on the single orbital entropy. I will not walk you through the details here, only through the recipe itself, where we generate this data from a quick and dirty um, DMRG calculation with considering all the orbitals, actually all the whole valence space can be considered, to figure out what are actually uh, those orbitals that pick up a single orbital entropy. And those are the orbitals that we put in the active space. Um, this is a quick and dirty calculation. The energy is crap, but the qualitative nat nature of the wave function converges faster than the energy, and this is what we rely on. We identify the important orbitals, and then we do the decent calculation. Of course, when we have the decent calculation, we can see whether what we expected in one was actually still found in three as a converged solution. So there's a kind of a double check option uh, in this. But this is a way to automate calculations. And in fact, uh, we have a gra graphical user interface that's hooked up to the Open Molka's uh, quantum chemistry program package. We have a com command line interface that can be used in autonomous explorations and, and that works quite nicely. Okay, so that can be done. We can uh, generate um, reference data in a rolling fashion, even for multi-configurational cases. Let me go to the second example. 
semi-classical dispersion interactions because they were actually designed to improve on DFT and they do, uh, but they have another residual error and you don't know how big that, well, that error is. Here you see the expression of uh, this, uh, it's called the D3 correction by uh, Stefan Grimme, um, which is um, very, very, very similar to, to um, uh, a Leonard Jones type um, force field contribution or contribution in the force. Field. Now we take this expression <coughs> in, in an analogy to the Kohler matrix, which is basically a matrix constructed from the external potential used as a similarity con, uh, um, measure such as SOAP in machine learning applications. Uh, very much in analogy to how the Kula matrix is handled, we take this guy, uh, diagonalize it, and take the eigenvalues as the descriptor, so as the input to the Gaussian process. In order to define a delta machine learning model, as you can see here, where, say, we have the DFT results, which is indicated here as a PBE functional, then there's this semi a classical correction D3 on top of it, uh, and we have some residual error to a reference reference data, which typically is again covered cluster data, and the Gaussian process can now correct for that. Right, just to, to show the kernel looks like this, and x y and x x x j are the inputs, and they are the eigenvalues, as I said, of the diagonalized uh, um, D3 matrix, the expression that you have seen before. Of course, we need training data. We took some data from the literature, like uh, the Hopsa. Uh, well-known Hopsa basis set of dispersion-dominated interacting molecules. We created our own dispersion-dominated interacting molecules, like these ethene, pentane, uh, dimers, and so on. So this, this is just reference data to test the approach. Uh, this is some more technical details so that you know what we did. Uh, we tried to approach the complete basis set limit so that the technical issues are reduced to an utmost extent. We had to use DLP and O couple cluster in order to be efficient, in order to, to get this through in a, in a reasonable amount of time, well knowing that this comes with more thresholds uh, because there's nothing for free if you suddenly have um, such a capable method. Uh, and then we realized that you, you, can, you can do this data machine learning approach. The Gaussian process improves on uh, the D3 model in a very efficient way. And you can even improve on the training process where we realized that uh, what we call batch wise variance based assembling, BVS, uh, the new data, we, we introduce new data points into the training um, based on the maximum variance uh, that we see in the statistical model. And so that works quite well. Uh, there's an automated workflow in which this can be addressed. And so this is a way to even improve with machine learning and uncertainty quantification by machine learning on uh, a, composite, a composite model like DFT plus semi-classical dispersion interaction, which is already thought to be good. But frankly, and I haven't shown this here, will be on the next slide. When you look into the details, you can encounter problems where errors accumulate. This is again, would be again a situation where a large error, even for these tiny corrections, could hit you with, without noticing. Um, what I was referring to is basically uh, this, this second point here, but let me first introduce you to this slide. This is just related work based on uncertainty quantification, uh, because that is earlier work that we did before we realized that, I, that the uncertainty quantification based on statistical measures uh, that we extract from, for instance, Gaussian process regression. Um, before we understood that this is the way to go, we did this, right? where we had benchmark data and we tried to um, assess the benchmark data and the importance of benchmark data. These are very simple and very, very long known schemes, bootstrapping and jackknifing from the late 70s where you generate artificial samples um, from the data that you have. Um, so data can be repeated in these new uh, synthesized samples. And jackknifing allows you to carve out single or, or groups of data points to figure out what their importance is. And that allows you to also uh, um, attach an uncertainty measure uh, to the prediction that you do. And this, actually, we did for the same D3 uh, a dispersion correction, and uh, this is where we found that if, if for, for certain molecules, you cannot rely on error compensation. So there are mechanisms where these weak contexts, of which you have more and more with increasing molecular size, uh, can 
uh, lead you into a region where error compensation is not in operation. And in fact, we can generate uh, exceedingly large errors. So it's necessary to have this uh, data machine learning model then in order to figure out well, whether that actually happens or not. Uh, we also use data, data, data machine learning to improve on system focused self parameterizing and atomistic models, which is basically generating based on quantum chemical data, force field data, just to increase exploration speed in, in uh, expensive computational campaigns, uh, but in a way that we know what the accuracy is. And the data machine learning also does not only uh, uh, tells us what the accuracy is or the reliability, it allows us also to improve. Uh, I'm not, I don't know how I'm doing time-wise, but this is my conclusion slide. Um, it's time. Yes, it's time my, main, my, my main point here is that uh, I think one would, would, should be very careful uh, considering the traditional ways of benchmarking uh, quantum chemical methods because of the transferability problem. And in my view, uh, even large benchmark sets, there's no benchmark set that is large enough to cover uh, all chemical space as needed. Uh, you approach a new chemical problem, you basically uh, don't know how, how accurate your, your results uh, will be. They can be accurate uh, for the majority of the data that you produce, but there might be individual data points for which you assume the accuracy is there, but in fact, you can't. <coughs> you lost Sorry. Your image. Don't see you. Okay, and I, I hope that I've convinced you that Gaussian process regression is a nice theme and to, to exploit. I our estimates, and uh, we actually employ this in system-focused self-improving models, and uh, I've shown you several examples. Uh, the work was, of course, not done by me, but uh, the excellent people in my group, and I'm extremely grat grateful for all their work. Uh, you see my current group here, the people who have done the work, uh, you have seen uh, in the references. Financial support was from ETH Zurich, Swiss National Science Foundation, the German uh, from, of the chemical industry, the German Science Foundation, and the Swiss uh, National Combat Center for Catalysis. Thank you very much for your kind attention.